Hey folks, uh, my name is Jessica Mashkovich and I am the host of One Take with Jess. Today, my guest is Miguel Navarro. He is an innovator, patented inventor, seasoned digital leader, seasoned, which means you're old, like me. <laughs> we are seasoned. And uh, besties with CX, which is customer experience, which you have to be, because if you're an innovator, you have to make sure it blends with what customers are wanting and how they want it. So Miguel, welcome to One Take with Jess. I'm sorry for all the technical problems that we both had in hopping on, but we made it. We made it. That's right. Well, you know what? I look at it as experience together, as a bond that we formed pre-show. So <laughs> no, I think, I mean, how many guests have you had that you've had that bond pre-show? I find myself very at, in a very advantageous position right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I was recording it because it would be the outtakes. It would be like my face zoomed up on what is going wrong with, but I don't record those those types of pre-show bloopers. Maybe we'll have some good bloopers during the show. You never know. That's right. You'll never know, right? <laughs> Well, I am happy to have um, to have you on because the conversation is going to be around AI, which is artificial intelligence. And that's something that's near and dear to your heart. You use it every day, talk about it every day. I know you've chatted with other people about it. And now I'd like you to chat about it with me and my audience. And we're going to start from the bare basics. Is, is chat GPT like Alexa? Oops, it probably heard me. Or how would we differentiate these things? So I'm trying to explain like what chat GPT and, and generative AI is to my dad. And they have they have an Alexa. Alexa, I can't say it out loud. Um, how would I describe that to them? So it's actually really cool because I love that you brought up A-L-E-X-A, -E right? Let's call it that, or Echo. Um, so... I do think that the when people mention oh the initial hype, right, of conversational AI or conversational artificial intelligence, I do believe that it's a little bit there because if you look at the ALEXA model, it's very prescriptive. It's almost like you have to know and you have to understand what it is that's being said. But before I deep I go deep into conversational AI, let's go into what AI is, right? So there's typically three um, categories that I like to use it for. And there's actually a buddy of mine at work that started talking about it again. And it just kind of like jump started my brain into, oh, this is like the best way to explain AI. So the first category is narrow AI, right? So if you look about it in that sense, it's very narrow in scope. It's very specific in what it is that you need it to do. So if you think about a chat bot, right, and it's very specific that it would be able to help you in your banking needs, you know, that's narrow AI. If you have AI that in data analytics be able to predict to you within the next month what your highest numbers would be be within the normal range and your lowest number would be in the lowest range without creating any anomalies to then tell you everything's going normal, that is narrow AI. The next category is what's called general AI. So general AI is a little bit broader for obvious reasons than narrow AI. It's almost that I really believe it's really where a lot of the applied intelligence really happens. So if you think about it from the Tesla perspective of being able to detect objects so you don't hit it, um, there's a lot of computer vision that kind of goes into it, a lot of machine learning and a lot of applied machine learning into the artificial intelligence. So when a car is moving, and if you think about this, so many different ways a ball can go in front of a car or a child or a dog or you know, a stop sign can fall or anything like that for the car to predict that it is a foreign object that it will need to stop or st steer clear of it. That level of artificial intelligence is kind of like general and broad. Uh, so I am consistently flowing and moving where the machine learning aspect of it gets changed based off of what's happening. So there's that like kind of cycle of learning and almost like um, autonomous. I would say that's a little bit on like the general AI type level. 
And then the other one is just what I call like end of the world AI, where AI just kind of like <laughs> takes over, it just like supersedes the human intelligence. And it's just like, oh yeah, and all of a sudden we're just essentially we're owned by our computers that we once created. Right, There's, right. Uh, yeah. That's funny. It's funny that yeah, you went so. into those examples because that's how I always, like AI can stand for different things in my head. There's the artificial intelligence, there's the algorithm intelligence, and then there's autonomous intelligence. And autonomous exactly. is when the machines take over and you and I will hopefully be in their good graces because we've, we've talked so nicely about them. Absolutely. And that's what, again, I always tell a, my A-L-E-X-A or Amazon device, please, right? And thank you. Because it's just, you oh, know, because I don't know if right. you eventually be my boss, right? At the end of this. <laughs> me this too. I really think sure. you guys, you and I might be the only ones that are, you know, courteous to, yeah. to the A-L-E-X-A. Um, but, you know, you touched on a couple of things and, and in talking about the A-L-E-X-A and, uh, the word chatbot, it, it is kind of a chatbot. You ask it a question, it kind of goes into its little repository, which is the internet. And it brings back, uh, like if I ask a recipe for chicken, it will say recipes.com says, you know, this and that and the other thing. And it will give me what it goes out to, to get and deliver it back. And then um, AI becomes a little bit more humanistic in it tries to continue solving for... I have a dog barking in the background. Oh. <laughs> it tries to continue solving, uh, you know, for what you want to do with your chicken. But also if you say, can you make recommendations as to something else, it'll continue to evolve and you'll have a conversation with it and it goes deeper and more expansive. Um, can you hear that dog barking in the background? Oh, barely, barely. That picking so, up. Okay. Yeah, no, you're, you're, um, the voice isolation and noise canceling is working oh, very well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, no, like, so yeah, I actually have two dogs myself. So um, the functionality I do love, and again, this is AI at work, right. is when it picks up spikes, right? Or sounds that aren't quite normalized, it cancels it out. And uh, then that's the reason why, you know, again, I don't know if folks are hearing it, but I honestly barely hear anything on your end. But the one item that, you know, I would say, and what's really neat right now in the generative AI world is for the longest time, right, um, A-L-E-X-A um, and all the other chatbots were prescriptive. And what I mean by that is there's three kind of basic um, attributes that make a prescriptive or your traditional, let's call it the traditional chatbot. So the first layer is your intent. So the intent is what it is that you want it to do. So if let's say, if going into banking, you wanted to explain what mobile deposit is, let's call that intent explain mobile deposit. So the second piece are called utterances. So the utterances are the pathways into why we would use the intent. So if a client or a customer asked, what is mobile deposit? How do I do mobile check deposit? How do I do mobile check C-H-E-C-K deposit? You know, so again, in I know that in Canada, because, you know, I used to work for TD, it's like, again, we had to be very conscious of C-H-E-Q-U-E versus, you know, C-K. So those are definitely little nuances, right? That as a as a linguistics type person, you're going to need to be cognizant of, and you would know just through those little things. There's about like ten thousand different ways, right, to land into that intent of, you know, what is mobile deposit. So again, very different from how do I do mobile deposit. So again, layer one is intent. Layer two is the utterances, and then now the third uh, attribute is response. So after someone had asked hey, how do I, or what is mobile deposit and hit the intent of what is mobile deposit, you would now need to respond. And that's the third attribute. And then, so you can explain what is mobile deposit. So I think how generative AI has kind of changed is that the utterances, right, have now been super easy to recreate because now you have these um, platforms like GPT um, platforms that allow you to understand 
like whatever that request is to be able to conversationalize the request and not just words, not just people saying things. It's able to conversationalize a book. It's able to conversationalize a website. So those utterances and those inputs now have like changed. And then now, especially the responses have also had a conversational piece to it. So just like what you mentioned earlier, Jessica, where before, you know, I would ask for a recipe for chicken with my A-L-E-X-A and it would refer me to uh, recipes.com and then say, oh, this is, you know, you ask for a chicken marsala recipe, here you go. But now you'd be able to ask something along the lines of, hey, listen, I have chicken, scallions, garlic, mushrooms. I don't know what to make. Can you give me suggestions? And it will grab contacts, right? And not the... And not just content, and that's kind of like the weirdest thing about it, is it grabs context from recipes.com and all these different sites, knowing, right, like that you had said, I only have these ingredients, do its own cross-reference checking of it, and then come back and say, hey, also because, you know, you only have 20 minutes before you go to, let's say, your uh, party or go out with your friends, you know, I know that you only have 20 minutes because I've grabbed like any other like data point that was available to me as well. And now letting you know that making chicken marsala might not be the thing for you, but I'll teach you how to make a chicken sandwich. You know, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's really <laughs> That's interesting because you just mentioned the whole grabbing, like maybe it has access to your calendar. Maybe it has access to your, uh, how many people are in your family? You know, are you making it for four people or are you making it for two people tonight? Jessica, like, I love when it the calls my name, they're like, oh, the Alexa does it, but chat GPT doesn't know me that intimately yet. How, <laughs> how, um, it should though, I use it quite often. How, uh, I'll use the word intimate again, but how intimate should we get with things like chat GPT? So for example, I can input all of my fin financial information. I can input spreadsheets, uh, not spreadsheets, but I can input all of the data of my assets, my liabilities, my expenses, um, what I own, what I don't own, um, people in my household a and how, like, I want it to be able to know me in order to, if I say, well, how else can I earn passive income or what can I be doing better or where can I be saving money? I want it to know me, but then again, I don't want it to know me. How do we balance that? It's actually a very good question. So the one thing that I tell folks is for the most part, especially, and this is how um, the model is very different, right? Like, so when you use ALEXA um, or an Amazon device, let's call it that, and uh, invoke and ask questions, et cetera, it's attached to your account. It's attached to all the things that you're asking it to do remembers and then uh, creates data attributes right into your account to then be able to figure out, oh, how can I sell Jessica a pair of jeans? How can I sell Jessica chicken marsala on the go with my uh, affiliate partnership with DoorDash? Right. You know, so like yeah. all of those things and it goes into kind of the sellability of it. I'm not saying that chat GPT or open AI doesn't have that, at least it doesn't have it built yet. But the one thing that I would say, and kind of take this with a grain of salt, is that I think when it comes to asking chat GPT things, um, you know, there's always risk of your data being exposed. So I always tell folks, even, you know, and just um, part of social training now that I uh, engage folks in, is you treat your email address, your phone number, as if it's your social security number. Because in the digital world, a email address, phone number, or anything that is PII, right, or uh, personal identifiable information, that is as good as a social security number, you know, because it is identifiable to exactly you. So in the digital age, in the digital world, I tell people don't give out PII info about you. And then more information attached to that, because then it'll be able to link it. You're allowing the system to be able to link it for you. But on the other hand, the reason why, um, and a little bit of backstory, right, on um, OpenAI. Um, so Instagram, uh, let's start with Spotify. 
it took Spotify 150 days to get to 1 million users. It took Instagram 75 days to get to 1 million users. OpenAI through ChatGPT took five days to get to 1 million users, right? So you know that people are using this and you know that people are very active on it. So the one thing that I tell folks that are active on it is just be cautious on the information that you're uh, giving it because if you actually read the terms in ChatGPT or OpenAI, is they don't treat confidential information as confidential. They just kind of say it out there and don't necessarily have a choice about it. So if you're giving them bank account numbers, et cetera, then obviously like one, you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, anything that you would not tell your neighbor or your friends, you probably should not be telling an AI engine where, and this is another spit to it, um, we are essentially trainers of chat GPT today, right? So anytime we, um, create any prompts for, um, you know, so we're right now we're prompters and labelers. So that's, so those are kind of the two jobs that I tell people that's going to emerge as, you know, generative AI become more and more uh, into society and in businesses, there's going to be two jobs that'll emerge and it's going to be prompters and labelers. Uh, and then eventually that'll normalize and that'll be just be part of the skill set, just like how people know how to use Excel, right? So it's just, that's going to be that. But when Excel was new, people who were great at Excel, you know, quote unquote, excelled at their jobs and got promoted because, oh my God, you're so innovative. But the idea yeah. here, right, is that I tell people you're prompters and labelers because we are essentially what makes chat GPT better than most of the large language models out there. Because Again, the adoptability, right, of OpenAI's chat GPT is so high. And again, I compared it to like Instagram and Spotify. And if multiple people are prompting it, and let's call multiple like millions uh, at a daily basis are prompting it. And every single time there's a result, people are hitting a thumbs up. Oh, that's the correct answer or a thumbs down. That's not the correct answer. We, in essence, are training it every day. So... That being said, would you like your data to be considered training data, right? So right. not that uh, they're not right. necessarily right. going to do anything with your phone number, but eventually when you give it no, the but opportunity you, you to- know, you, you speak of, of something very true. And uh, I work for a large company. You work for a large company. We're, we're being told, not being told, but it's okay to experiment with the latest technologies. But um, there's been some people who are just unknowingly trying to do their jobs better utilizing um, chat GPT, open AI, um, generative AI to try and do some reporting or to try and put together a presentation. And, and it may say the name of the bank or it may say some <laughs> proprietary information. And um, while they don't realize that this is wrong because they're doing it for their own purposes and you know, they were told to experiment with it and see how it can make things better in their group. Maybe they wanna recommend something for their team on how to better use technology to do their jobs better. But meanwhile, you are feeding the engine proprietary data. So we do have to be careful. Um, there's there's definitely some uh, things that we can make generic, like I work for big bank or um, how would I innovate, you know, a certain process, you know, keep things very generic, but, you know, utilize it for for what it's worth. It, it will end up changing the future. It will end up... Um, parsing people into those roles that you mentioned, um, as well as people need to skill for that. They need to be aware that there probably will be job cuts. There probably will be efficiencies that are reaped. It's really a hard thing to say. It's like being a cab driver when you see Uber is coming. You know, your medallion might not be worth as much as it was a while back. And then for Uber drivers, autonomous driving is coming. So please reskill, you know, you might not be at the wheel or as many of you might not be at the wheel in the future. So we do see the future ahead. And um, what you say, what you say rings very true. Yeah, the uh, one thing too that, you know, I tell folks is you really have to, and how I advise uh, bigger companies. And so one of the things I do is, you know, kind of, kind of like, you know, give um, these folks advice and uh, kind of layer out what is the path forward into, you know, how you would be able to adopt it. And one of it, right, is being able to 
um, not necessarily legalize uh, generative AI in your organization, because I'm sure a lot of different organizations kind of have it on lockdown, but really more create a path for responsible use, right? So it's the same as, you know, you have people right now um, in a bank, right? That there are people that have access to people's account and they can literally go to green screen, change the dollar amount, right, in production, and that's now going to be the data that's going to come out. Yes, sure, like alarms are going to sound, et cetera. But that's because we're looking forward into what was, you know, the start of like the digital age in banking. So if you're looking 20 years ahead, right, of where we are today, obviously generative AI would be normalized. It's being used every day. And people will talk about, oh, remember the time when we couldn't use this or we can do this or it used to be so simple. Now this is actually the real use of it. I do believe that one, so just the same as the iPhone coming out, um, you know, into the world, generative AI would be as impactful. You know, I really do believe that it's going to change how people think, how people behave and how businesses, you know, think and behave as well. But the more important piece is being able to understand that we are in the infancy stage. This is like the time when the game that we had on the iPhone was just this giant red button and you just keep like tapping on it and figuring out, oh, who can tap it the longest? And then there's a high score to now, right? We have console level games on the iPhone. So the thing that I uh, tell people is this is just the beginning and it's only going to get better from here. So when we look ahead, I think part of the item, right, the principles that we have to build inside the company of responsible use for AI, we need to start writing that now. You know, when we start training our own models of generative AI in our organization, we need to start that now. You know, we need to right. write so down we, those So we have lots of people, Elon Musk, calling for yeah. boundaries, calling for like, let's not let this get out of hand because you can potentially write a code. You know, did you ever see war games way, way back? Oh, yeah, like, I, 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 lo I love it. We're do you want to play a game? Like, you know, like yeah. all of a sudden the computers are <laughs> they're doing their own stuff and you're like, what? What happened here? So uh, that that is fearful. If you don't start setting some regulations or put boundaries in place, guardrails, as yeah. as we've called it, and um, being early, I know that that's a term that we use a lot in the metaverse. Um, you know, with with blockchain, NFTs, metaverse action, uh, we're early, and we are. We are so early. The people that ha own NFTs or the people that have transacted on blockchain. Very, very few. Like when you when you zoom out, you see how large of a population there is in the world. And then so few people have experienced that or know even what an NFT is or what the metaverse is. Um, so being early, right time, right place is like we can kind of get our 10,000 hours in and become experts in this field and then hit the ground running eventually when people catch up. So I think you and I are in a, a great position being the innovators, being the ones that are just thirsting for learning and watching this evolve, even evolving it ourselves. You know, we could potentially evolve this for financial services um, or for any other industry. But there's been some question, is AI just a bubble? Oh, I, I honestly love that question because the thing is, is AI has been in use for a very long time. It's just this one segment of it is popularized. I don't think that AI is a bubble and some segments of it, you know, could be, I think eventually. I don't think that, uh, I think generative AI um, has hit that critical point where, you know, it'll forever be part of the landscape. It's the same as, I would say the same as blockchain today. Though there are folks that's uh, kind of like saying, oh, the metaverse is dead or anything like that. It's just really more, we're not talking about it. You know, I'm still deep in Web3. I'm still deep in the metaverse today. Yep. But yes, like, you know, my passion maybe might have like moved a little bit on generative AI because it's moving faster um, as of right now. But if you think about transference, right, in people as to like how people affect other people, it goes the same with technology. So the Palm Pilot and the Pocket PCs before in the 90s existed, but the internet or the infrastructure for broadband internet wasn't there. So it didn't necessarily reach the usage, right, of uh, critical mass uh, for it to be heavily adopted. 
what ended up happening was when it got reinvented, you know, in uh, 2007, right, to for it to become the iPhone. And again, mind you, the BlackBerry is already out. But the BlackBerry is almost doing everything. The only thing that's different is everyone loved the iPod. You know, so it wasn't necessarily creating a pocket PC or creating a Palm Pilot or a digital, a handheld digital assistant. It's an iPod that can also use the phone. You know, so again, it's marketed differently. And, you know, the there's definitely a bit of shift into how it was done. Plus the fact that, you know, so music, right? If you think about where MP3s were at the time and then where, internet was kind of booming and where broadband telecommunications it was kind of coming as well as 3g oh my god 3g was so fast like again it was just kind of like this perfect storm for the iphone to really thrive in you know and right. again um you know and it's funny because i always use this analogy as well that when i look at the prescriptive model of a chatbot just like what i mentioned building was so manually the intent, the utterances, the responses, I definitely label that as kind of the Blackberry of chatbots because how generative AI is moving things along now, I really do believe that that's the iPhone for chatbots, you know? And that's also how it's going to change a lot of the different industries. And, you know, I really do think that there's a lot of opportunity. And I know that uh, earlier um, we were talking about, oh, there's potential job losses or job replacement, displacement that'll end up happening. But also, just like what I mentioned earlier, and I think Jessica, you and I have talked about this as well, there's also growth, right, and opportunity. And you have to be there in, uh, within that growth. And you need to put in those 10,000 hours to be a really good prompter, to be a really good labeler. And then, a, you know, word of caution for people just trying to dump in 10,000 hours. There's also a difference with the quality of 10,000 hours that you put in, right? It's just like going to the gym, not because you go to the gym means you're going to lose weight. You know, like you go to the gym, you got to hit the treadmill. You got to have a really, um, you know, your strategy for creating your workout regimen and executing that workout regimen needs to be top notch. Because if it's not, and you're just showing up on the gym and you're just on the same elliptical every day doing exactly the same thing. I mean, it, even if you spend 10,000 hours, it's not the same as someone spending 10,000 hours the right way. So that's the one thing I keep telling folks is, yeah, spend those 10,000 hours, but make sure that you're also looking left and right, up and down and looking at where the world is shifting and turning. So you can, you know, again, adapt into where things are going versus where you believe it is and then uh, not necessarily make the moves that the entire world is, you know, doing. Right. Yeah. And I believe in talking to people a lot about it. So you and I oh, are having, absolutely. you know, peer to peer conversations. I'll have conversations with my kids I'll have conversations with my parents just because, you know, if they start knowing the words, even the keywords that are mentioned, they, they already are winning. You know, it already sounds familiar to them if they ever get deeper into the field, especially, you know, my kids who are of college age. I mean, my son, basically ChatGPT was his best friend for his philosophy class in college there you go. at Penn State. But, you know, that's because he is practicing his prompting skills, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so he's taking an evol and evolving, you know, the class beyond what he's learned because you have to read through mm -hmm. the material anyway and, and do what you need to do. It doesn't spit out a perfect assignment. You have to continue learning, if not more, about philosophers because you have to reread the paper and reread this and tweak that. So he probably got a better education about philosophy from it. Um, but also at the same time, you know, utilizing technology and not being afraid to do it. So I think a lot of um, people who are scared and it's passing them by and they just want to hide in a hole. It, it is better to have conversations with people and be able to explain it in layman's terms. And AI has so many great uses already. Um, I just did a podcast with a doctor who's who they're using it in the medical field, not him, but even broader doctors and, and the medical field itself to read images, to help triage. Um, people are using chat GPT and, and generative AI to explain things to patients like that. That I has love, probably I, better I bedside that. manner than some, than some people, <laughs> <laughs> than some doctors. Um, but all of these things are affecting all of the fields all at the same time. 
So becoming versed in it is, uh, is pretty essential reading what's going on with innovation. So is, um, is something, do you see something putting the brakes on this? Like, for example, if we do come in and there is regulation or there are boundaries or guardrails put in place, do you see things coming to a halt in terms of the way businesses are using it right now? We're, we're all in the open AI or open, um, forum for leveraging the tools that are out there, but if they start becoming only by license or only, uh, whatever guardrails come in place, which starts to limit our access to it. Where do you see that going? Or do you see that coming up anytime soon? Yeah, like, I think um, a part of being, you know, part of being part of a capitalistic society, <laughs> you definitely see that happening more in the monetization aspect of things. But it also, I feel, you know, I feel like the folks that are serious about it, like you and I, like we'll continue doing what we're doing. You know, like I think, um, you know, like if more regulation or any setbacks that happen, and I mean, there are a ton of companies that don't allow it at work yet, people still use it, right? So I do think that um, for it to evolve, you know, we're going to need to really work on figuring out like what really are the real risks, right? So it's the same thing as, you know, I mean, yeah, like all risks are legit as far as, Oh, if I go outside the house, yes, it increases the risk of me getting mugged or me getting punched in the face, but also at the same time, but then I get to have friends, right? Like, so it's the same thing as going out and being social, you know, uh, being a parent now, like, you know, and I have a two-year-old and I'm like always thinking in my head, oh, like my son should be like social and just go out there, et cetera. Is there no fear in my head that, oh, my son might get bullied or something like that? Of course there is, right? But the reward is so much bigger than the risk. So it's the same thing as being able to drive from point A to point B. If you think about all the plenty accidents, right, that happen uh, from like car to car, or just any car accidents that do happen, and it's definitely stacked up, right? And uh, there's definitely regulation now as to, oh, you need to have a license to be able to drive. You know, the drive to drive, you know, is still a lot higher right, then, oh, me not getting my license because it's so much work. And if it's someone who, and there are people that don't have driver's licenses or don't drive because they live in the city and they don't, they just commute, you know, use public transportation because there's no need for it. And there will be industries later down the road with like generative AI where they will see, hey, you know what, like in generative AI, we don't necessarily need it. That's but true. then there are, you know, certain folks that, oh, because they live 30 minutes from everywhere, they're going to need to drive, you know, so um there's a different use and different acceptability rate to it right but the piece i think where folks are missing is that we really do need to get into the evolution of it us stopping right and honestly removing the competitive thing and i'll go back into the competitive thing later but removing the competitive thing it's the same thing as um going into the pool right you know you're gonna go in the pool because you're already wearing your bathing suit you're already out there. Your friends are already in there, you know, yet you're there procrastinating, right? You're using your fingers, feeling how cold the pool is. You're using your toes to feel how cold the pool is. And you're doing all of these like measurements, right? To create data, analyze and measure risk, et cetera. But you know, you're going to end up being in the pool, you know? So it's almost, so at that point, dude, just jump in the pool, right? Because you know, you're going to end up being in the pool. So if you know that, right? I mean, I, I would say, and just like what I was like saying, it's like dipping your toe in, not to be able to measure how cold the water is because it's absolutely irrelevant whether you're jumping in the pool, especially if you've got friends in there, but being able to dip your toe in the pool to feel how cold the water is for it to acclimate in your body, that's a good purpose to it, right? Like, so when we're talking about innovation, et cetera, you don't, it really depends on the purpose. If you're innovating, just so like you can yeah. say, or you're creating new things, eh, might not be like the best way to sell it to a bank. But if you uh, go to a bank and say, hey, we're going to try this new thing because we're going to get $2 million back. No one's listening to what it is that you're doing. All they heard is I'm getting $2 million back. So whatever that is or was, please go ahead and do it. Right. So right. that's and, you know, and that's kind of like the piece where I tell folks, this is where like a lot of the communication skills really come into play, because as 
a general whole. And if we know that we need to jump in the pool so we can just then have fun, right? And really um, be able to hang out with friends and be able to just get on with our day. Um, it's the same with be uh, adopting right into generative AI. We know that this is something that has already changed, but everyone's saying, stop, don't do anything mm -hmm. because the organization is protecting themselves. But then who right. in the organization is actually pushing forward the agenda of, well, let me understand your risks. Let's line it up and let's slowly start taking the steps to go in the pool of generative AI. Right, because so you're going to have that... other people who are a lot more nimble, a lot more, um, I don't want to say risk risky as opposed to risk averse, yeah. who are going to jump into the pool and then they're going to figure it out once they get in there. And it wasn't as risky Absolutely. as they thought and the benefits greatly outweigh you know, the risk that happened. And you don't want to miss the opportunity before that pool starts to charge people an entrance fee. Exactly. <laughs> Very high entrance fee. Exactly. Like I'm thinking, or, what are all of the blogs that I need to write right now in my whole life? Like, what, what are all yeah. of the things that I need to do? Because it's, it is quite accessible and missing that opportunity for innovation. Being Absolutely. on the forefront is... Or Im imagine from a competitive perspective, right? So like, let's say, um, you know, uh, you have like... a uh, pool party, et cetera, or let's call it Olympics, right? And people have I love all of our years, analogies, you know, but I, it does, I, I, it, makes I, it, it makes it digestible. I, like if I'm talking to my dad or to my boss or to, you know, someone who's not fully entrenched in this. Absolutely. And so think about it from the adoptability scale, right? Of four years, every four years, there's a freaking Olympics, right? And yep. we know that we have four years time to train for that Olympics because the four years is going to happen with or without us. So I think right. one note that we need to understand is the world doesn't revolve around like one person or one organization. It really doesn't. The world will move with or without you. And that being said, would you rather want four years to train in that swimming competition in that very cold pool? Or would you rather have a week to train? Because I guarantee you, Right. Like, so when we're talking about adoption and all of that, the earlier you adopt, the earlier you figure out what it is that you need to do, or anytime you're throwing in a stroke, right? And there's definitely one muscles don't build overnight. You need to allow years, right, for that correct muscle to build for you to be able to swim so much more efficiently. If you don't allow time to build for that muscle to build up, then one, you've already put yourself at a disadvantage. And then number right. two, imagine like trying to learn how to swim a week before the Olympics. It's just like, that's where like banks were before it right? when it comes to technological, digital, or any customer experience type thing, because we were so traditional and the entire world changed around this where, you know, Macy's became, you know, very, very digital. And now you can do the complete experience of shopping through the mobile app. And it's the same with Netflix and Blockbuster. You know, so again, being able to really figure out the goal, do you want to be the world's best video rental store that when people, mer oh, you know, migrate from, a, you know, them going to a rental store, going someplace else, all of a sudden you you've become irrelevant? No, you don't want to be that, right? You just want to be the company or organization that provides media to your people. And if Blockbuster kept that goal, instead of trying to be the best video store, then they'd probably still be alive today. But the Good you know, point. process, Good right, point. of adoption, yeah. right? And that's kind of like the piece is that, again, I tell people, when would you want to practice? Four years before the Olympics or one week before the Olympics? Because I right. guarantee you, the earlier we start, the bigger chance of success, you know, yeah. so. So how do and, you, how do you get large institutions that are set in their ways? So for example, I'm just going to take a, a big bank as an example. There's branches, um, there's, you know, customer service reps, there's financial advisors, there's lots of people that have a lot of jobs that um, the way that fintechs have come into the scenario puts big banks on their, on their heels, or I don't know if that's the right analogy, in saying, where are customers, these college students or kids that are coming out of school, they're going to be banking like immediately. Do My daughter will never see the inside of a bank. Like she will, there's no reason for her to step foot in a branch. And how are we designing for our future customers? 
So in terms of using um, AI, are people in large institutions more apt to try and use AI to replicate old practices? Like for example, you know, someone comes in, has a question, asks a customer service rep or calls the 800 number, asks a customer service rep on the phone. Well, we have a, an automated system for that now. Press one, press two, if you need this, press three. So we we replicated some kind of you know original system. Now, if you want a chat bot, it may chat back to you based upon the script that the original customer service people were using. So it's not yet, it's not yet, providing additional value and really leveraging the technology for the current persona you're designing to, you know, the up and coming people. Do you think that, how would you, if you made a bank, you own a large, big bank, how would you carve out groups that are able to design for the future, being that you're in a large institution that still has lots of people and practices to maintain? Very. I think, yeah, no, it's a great question. I would say part of like the thing that I would do is there are definitely in larger institutions, there are people who get defined by their job title, right? So if let's say I'm the head of marketing, I just believe, well, I'm the head of marketing because I know everything marketing versus believing, well, I know that I'm the head of marketing, but I know that I still have a lot to learn because I don't even have a TikTok account. Right. So those are kind of like the things that, you know, I tell folks, if you look at your organization, right, there are people that believe that they are their job description. And there are people that believe that their job description is part of who they are. And I would say I would get more of people that believe that the job description is part of who they are because they don't lose themselves in the job description. So just like what I mentioned, I wouldn't give the steering wheel of a, let's say, you know, running a TikTok marketing campaign to someone who doesn't use TikTok. It's the same thing as like trusting someone to drive you who's never driven before. And then when they get into an accident, you're like getting mad, like, oh, why'd you get into an accident? It's almost like, oh, you gave the steering wheel to someone who's never driven before. So, you know, if you're looking at almost like a bank, right? And if you look at kind of the uh, layers of credibility that we build, um, how many times have great ideas been turned down in a bank by a higher up who doesn't even understand what it is that you're pitching, right? That happens almost every day. Yeah. So, or it might threaten his or her headcount within his or her group. You know, I, absolutely. I'm known for managing, you know, 75 people. I don't want to now manage 30, even if, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I don't want this to go over to digital, because, you know, now they get the credit Absolutely. and now I I only have 35 people. So you don't necessarily want your innovators in a line of business, like, for example, retail branch or something. I'm just taking that for example, because I, in the future, I can see retail branches, physical branches kind of paring down to a very minimum if, mm -hmm. you know, if necessary for the future customer, because hopefully everything will be done online. Yeah. Um, so you don't want your innovators necessarily reporting up to the person who heads up the retail branches because you're like, how, how can they make that recommendation? Like, hey, we have to dissolve 75% of our retail branches in the next, you know, 10 years. Yeah. It's a rough one. And, no, and that's kind of like where um, influencing without authority comes in, right? So influencing without authority is kind of like my little favorite thing to do with um, you know, different teams, especially outside of my realm. So part of like the thing too, that I feel like organizations, and let's just call it like a big bank for now. One of like the issues with a big bank is that their departments are so siloed, right? So if you think about, okay, digital, this is what you're doing. This is what um, you know your mission is, et cetera. So, okay, I'm gonna build like the best mobile app, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, okay, how does that connect into the, retail branch business. And you're like thinking, well, you know, that's not necessarily my problem because I'm a different silo. Than, and, you know, if you think about like kind of, you know, awards being handed out, no one ever gave an award of like, oh my God, like, you know, we're going to give, you know, let's say Citibank the digital department only, the, the digital department only of Citibank an award. You know, that's never happened. It's just like, it's just, hey, Citibank, you won this award. Because the thing is, is in the consumer's world, 
Citibank is only Citibank. There's no digital department. There's no retail branches. It's all one brand. So if you think about it from your huge organization's uh, huge organization's perspective, one of like the things that you know I tell people is you need, of course, if you're a digital person, you already know digital. Get to know things that you're not. You know, so go out there and partner with your phone channel. Go partner with your retail um, branch channel. Go read. Uh, go reach out to people that you haven't reached out to and know their problems. And that's how stage one, right, of being able to influence without authority is really building empathy, you know, building trust and building credibility. Those are the intangibles, right? They, they don't really teach you because there's no KPI for that. No one ever tells you like in your job performance, oh my God, we need you to build more trust, empathy, and, um, you know, credibility with like your people. No, they're, what they tell you is like, how many adopt, like how much did you, uh, how much operational cost savings did you do? How much sales did you do? You know, and oh, like, you know, how many times were you late? It's just like all these like old traditional metrics. So right. going back into traditional, right? So yes, your daughter and my son most likely will not step into a retail branch based on how it is constructed today. So if you actually reconstruct it, mm -hmm. right? And if you look, and this is where like um, me loving customer experience, right? So if you actually just listen to someone, imagine owning a restaurant, right? And someone said, hey, I want a cheeseburger. They're like, okay. And then two minutes later, you give them a hot dog with cheese. And they're like, this is not what I ordered. Oh yeah, but this is what you want. You know, and it's like, <laughs> what? That doesn't make sense. So if you think about it, right? Like as a bang, one of the things that we need to be doing is actually listening to our customers. Like, yes, I get it. We need to sell deposits. We need to sell credit cards. We need to sell savings accounts, et cetera. But we need to rethink that method. Is that even the best way it was 20 years ago? If it's no longer, right? Because digital is the way now that people are interacting on the initial step, then let digital handle that. Then what you can do is when you're not worried about that, then you can find your true purpose now, you know, because again, if you, it's the same thing as, you know, people being in a bad relationship and I tell this with like friends, they're in a bad relationship and they know they're not going to be in that relationship, but they're spending so much time and effort trying to fix the relationship that they know they're going to break eventually. And the thing that I keep telling people is like, listen, the longer you're in a relationship that you don't want to be in, whether it's friends or like a partner, the longer or the more time you're taking away from finding the one that you should be with or the friends that you should be hanging out with. Yes, because absolutely. You're so opportunity busy. cost. Exactly. Opportunity cost. And in Agile, we call it the cost of delay, right? So again, the, the idea, right? Like when it comes to retail branches, digital, phone channel, et cetera, is they're so fixated on traditional methods. Don't be so invested on the method, be invested in the goal and then be very movable in the method because the goal is more important than the method. You know, like the uh, right. tying your shoes isn't important. The, uh, the idea is where it is that you're going is important. You know, so it's almost like I tell people, like if, you know, you feel like tying your shoes is because you don't know how to tie your shoes, et cetera. Hey, try slip-ons. Right. Then you don't have to worry about tying your <laughs> shoes. Just focus on like where it is that you need to go. So the same thing with banks, you know, everyone's so focused on like, oh, generative AI, generative AI. Like, listen, you've got bigger problems to try. Right. <laughs> so the one thing that I tell people is, yes, generative AI may lead you to helping you or changing your methods, et cetera. But use that as a catalyst, right, into how you would change your method or how you would advise, let's say, your contact center person. Right. And let's say a contact center person is spending two hours a day, let's say summarizing conversations that all the conversations that they've had in the day and they're continue, they're looking at it, they're creating notes, summarizing and let's say two hours a day for every single contact center agent, you know, let's say is spent in summarization. Now you can do that with generative AI. And you can continue training the model. So then now those people, and it, it doesn't come like perfect, right? So one of the things I tell people is generative AI will never be perfect. That's the reason for prompters and labelers. So right. when someone is summarizing, right, their um, conversation, they are now a prompter and a labeler because then they're going to tell um, the, you know, the model that let's say your bank has created and they're going to summarize that conversation and you will then mark which ones were correct and which ones aren't, right? So then 
that can go to the labeler, right? Or I'm sorry, like you're the labeler and you're labeling it correctly. Then now it goes back to the dev team for them to adjust the model, right? And then repurpose it back. And then now if everything's coming in correct, then great, you move on. But imagine removing two hours, right? Out of like a thousand, let's say people from your contact center. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. Actually, you just like brought up the whole user experience side of things, but use cases is a big, big, uh, it's the, it, I'll use the word catalyst again. It's what drives people to create something based upon a use case. How are you going to use this? If you came to someone and said, I can give you a personal assistant right now, what would you have them do? They may tell you all of the tasks that they would hand to that personal assistant. And that in itself creates a use case. And if a lot of people are telling Mm. you that same task, that creates a use case for a certain population of people. So just like the customer service person that you described taking two hours to do a summary, that would Mm -hmm. itself make a use case and you can design around it to make that experience better and more Mm. efficient. Um, But yeah, you know, going into these people's lines of businesses, people's work, spending two weeks with every person that you, that you mentioned before, Absolutely, I would like, that would be a dream just to rotate through all of the different lines of businesses and, and the, the people that make it happen for that line of business. Yeah. And I keep telling folks, if it's something where, you know, talk to your manager, talk to whoever it is that you need to, to start introducing a program. And if they don't do it, then screw it, right? Do it yourself anyway. Like, so the thing is, it's the same thing as like going to a happy hour, right? Like, I mean, you take a chunk of time a little (laughs) after work, right? To socialize with people at work and you still, you're still building relationships, right? So, so do that, spend an extra hour after work or with someone, right? To then explain to you what their job is. So then you can understand that because then again, if let's say, and let's make it a little real, right? So Imagine I am a person who was the head of voice and emerging platforms when I was working for TV, which I was. And let's say I partnered extremely well with my risk partners that I knew every single thing that I had my own risk team in my head, which is mirrored, right? Which is a model based off of like the actual risk people that I have because I interacted with them every day. So then what would end up happening is if I were to throw a new product and let's say, let's call it a virtual reality thing, you know, I would go to my risk partners already answering those questions that they would have asked me and they would really appreciate it, right? Because they're like, oh my God, Miguel, it's so neat that you thought about us while you were going through this process. So guess what? Guess who's not going to get a hard time from risk, right? Me. So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is kind of like the one very specific example that I tell people, if you spend a lot of time with folks, then you do that. Now multiply that all across the approval people, right? That you'd have to do it. Yes, it's painful. Oh my God, there's so much approval that you know uh, you have to go through in the bank. And if you don't want to go through that, then don't work for a bank, right? So the thing that I tell people is, no, that those are the hoops that you're going to have to jump through because that's how the course was made. So you're going to have to do that and don't, you know, steer clear off of like tough work or things that are damn near impossible because greatness is built on that, right? Like builtness is based off of like how many people can actually achieve that if you stop trying, right? Or if anyone, if every, if every single person can do it, is that really an achievement versus, oh, you're one of two people who've done that. I mean, that is the achievement right there. Not necessarily what you've achieved, but the fact that not plenty have crossed that line. So right. the yeah, the one thing that I tell folks is again, focus on and you know, as an innovator, you know, don't and you know, innovation isn't necessarily associated with tech only. Innovation by definition is just trying new methods, you know, doing new ways. So do the same for you, right? Like you have to internalize and kind of like really look at yourself and do a reflection of who you are. And figure out, okay, what are the things that you've tried that's done really well? And what are the things that you haven't tried? And you know, just try and do that. The best way to look for something, right, isn't necessarily looking for it where you believe it is, though sometimes that helps. The one thing I keep telling people is if you're looking for something, you don't know where it is, start looking at places you haven't looked at yet. Don't 
try to go back to the place where you believe it is and stubbornly open the same drawer like three times because <laughs> you believe it's going to magically appear, you know, no, like move on, right? Like look at something, it's not there, move to the next place that you haven't looked, no matter how silly it is, because eventually you're either going to find it or find something else new. So yeah. Right. And like, keep looking say, outside of your, of your purview, like continue looking at what other exactly. people are doing, leverage other industries. Like it could be someone who makes blue jeans and they're doing the process that you think would be beneficial for the big bank or, you know, absolutely. just keep your yeah, ears I'm, open, read other things, listen to, to have conversations, like you said, and and, you know, again, our customers never like, you know, looked at us when they're using like the Amazon app and then they go into their banking app. And when something doesn't function the same as it was on the Amazon app, the customers or customers never say, oh, wait, guys, before we criticize so hard, this is a banking app and this is a re like a retail <laughs> app and they're very different and we should be a little bit more forgiving. No, like they don't care. And they all they believe is that the customer experience should be the same all across the board. And we should believe that, too. Right. There are certain instances where we say, yes, comparatively, right, when we're looking at do and doing competitive analysis, yes, we look at other banks, but we should also look past that because we need to really hold ourselves up to a higher standard. Absolutely. You know, the same standard and everyone is going, yeah. everyone's becoming a bank. So I know we're talking about banks a lot because that's where you and I currently sit. But, you know, do you have non banks that are becoming banks? You have your Absolutely. Apple card that's now a savings account you know, an, an interest bearing savings account. Um, but so, and it'll only be a hot minute before Amazon That's becomes right. a bank. So you could actually probably get your check automatically deposited to Amazon yeah. bank. I just made that up, but why not? Because most of your money goes there anyway <laughs> in everything and that I buy every month. <laughs> so all of a sudden now we're going to have to compete against their AI because all of a sudden they yes. became a bank. So again, like, yes, this is and where, they, have, like, they have the intimate knowledge of you. So they already know what you buy, how you buy. Exactly. Now they have your, your deposited check from your salary because <laughs> they're a bank. They're giving you interest. Um, right. But yes, so the, the playing field has gotten a lot broader. AI has made things a lot more, um, accessible and quicker and it, you're able to have conversations with the machine it's able to humanize itself and talk to you as if you were a financial advisor and what can i do for passive income how can i open up an ebay store you know some things where you may have come to your uh to a banker or to a person your trusted advisor to give you this information mm -hmm. you're now getting it from the machines we'll call it the machines um yeah. so we we have to jump into that pool sooner rather than later and have these conversations talk about uh, i was just uh privy to jeff chan yesterday did like a whole What's thing up, jeff chan? yeah he's he's great he is great to listen yeah, to awesome. and he does he brings the competitive environment straight to you know straight to you and hopefully a lot of people are signing into that people from all different job types Everyone in retail should be encouraged to listen to that. Everyone in, you know, all across the businesses, including risk to just listen to it and start hearing the keywords, start seeing what's on the forefront, start seeing what our competitors are doing out there. That's right. And um, just be aware, right? Yes. Be aware. It's, it's like, it should be required reading at this point. Um, yeah. For most well, it's people. really neat. <laughs> but this is good. This is a fun conversation. Oh, yeah. Now, again, thanks uh, so much for like, you know, including me here because this has been an amazing time. I can't think of a better way to spend, you know, my afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's flattering. I'll spend every afternoon with you talking about this stuff. Oh, Usually it's <laughs> my husband and I, we talk about this at the dinner table. We, we talk about this in passing. We talk, you know, all innovative technologies and where things are going. And so we're just that's one of what the I mean. It and just like what you just said right now, right? Like when you leave work, work doesn't leave you because this is part of you, yeah. you know? So yeah, and that's what I mean. It's just like, there are like folks who are like, oh, I'm clocked out and like, you know, I really don't care about digital, you know? And then it's just like, you know, they just kind of go back to work. So a person who doesn't, you know, drive a car, how could they be good at driving a car? Just the same as a person who doesn't necessarily believe 
in AI, I'm like, right. let's say you or me and your husband, it's just like, how can they truly drive innovation if they are not innovators? You know, so. True. Yeah. Exactly. And and I think you and I share, like, we're kind of cut from the same cloth. We have a good sense of what, you know, the consumer experience, we have a, a good handle on at least making sure that the consumer experience is up to snuff. We have a good handle on innovation. We have a good passion that we execute on. And, um, you know, hopefully more people will listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, right? Like it, it almost like makes sense, but also at the same time, I do want people to continue creating their content because I do enjoy listening to your podcast. I do enjoy listening to a bunch of like other folks as well because it really is just um, to me uh, the world and for people to believe that they know everything, especially when it comes to generative AI, because there's so many generative AI experts all of a sudden that kind of came out of the woodwork. You know, to me, I, I just find it funny, the word expert. It's just like we're all learning, right? Like we're all learning right now. Even AI enthusiasts are people who are, you know, sinking and swimming in AI from like a long time ago. Generative AI is new, you know? And I think people just need to really kind of humble themselves out and just really say that, hey, we're going through something new and beautiful. And let's kind of just like really explore it for what it is and not necessarily start like, you know, telling the world or just like kind of like creating these like chaotic, um, you know, things around it, you know, for what it really is. And, and, you know, that goes the same with innovators and people who are like writing down what the risks are. You know, I think folks just kind of really need to taper it down a bit and just kind of like let it be and let it grow and for folks to adopt into it rather than, you know, I don't know, like, I feel like for big organizations, for them to say stop, et cetera, there's definitely a sense of safeness to it. And that's why we do need the counterparts of innovators within that same organization to then lay down the track for to help their risk partners, right? And they need to be able to understand their risk partners and be able to lay down the track for the risk partners to then divert or create a, you know, a new path for them mm -hmm. to drive on. You know, so that's kind of like the piece where I feel like innovators have like a responsibility and a job to do. But, you know, again, like if the innovators, right, like in the organization just kind of like are making up information or quote unquote hallucinates, then, you know, obviously a lot of the um, risk things as it comes about, like the credibility gets destroyed. And then now that organization um, just feels like, oh, they can't really trust not just the generative AI piece, but the people working on the generative AI piece. Mm -hmm. And that's how you create that like competitive piece, right? That are like the... Um, yeah, like the the tug of war that happens into the part. That's yeah. why it's very important to, you know, really connect, uh, you know, with people as people and really right. be able to understand people's problems. Because at the end of the day, you know, people are going through their jobs because, again, they're looking for that security for their family, right? Be able to provide for their family. It's not like no one, no one really comes to work and wants to be bad at their job, you know? Like, so right. I feel... A lot of people forget that. And I feel like if we go out there and understand each other, you wouldn't have to create any effort to have a, other people understand you because then that becomes normal. You know, you don't have to fight for that. That's true. Very, very good words. So one more thing that I wanted to talk about, like just think about yes. the future, future. For example, any movies that you've seen that have like a relationship, someone has a romance with their AI and, and they develop a wonderful friendship and, and they talk about things. I saw the other day, um, that you can, you can take a picture with like your, uh, famous sports fan hologram. It was, Oh part yes, I did see. Oh my God. That's so cool. Yeah. That popped up on LinkedIn, but imagine being able to sit in a room with like a deceased relative and be able to have a conversation with that hologram. And the conversation is being had with the background of a generative AI who may have like accumulated knowledge on this past person. So it's answering you in the same mannerism as, as the person did. And then forget it. You have deep fakes where you can put the voice in there too. And literally people will live forever between their hologram and their deep fake voice. There is no such thing as loneliness anymore. You know, you can be with the people that you want to be with. I mean, it's just a very, very interesting world out there. 
Oh, absolutely. I um, honestly even reminds me of that one Black Mirror episode where, you know, like she couldn't let go of the of her like deceased partner, right? And just like continued having a relationship with this person's AI. Oh my know? gosh, I'm and, getting the chills right now. Yeah, I know, I know right? Say, ah. and it's and it's like nuts. Like to me, it's just yeah, like if we kind of look Not at too far look away. At, yeah. And you know, if you think about like how you know, coping, right, like, can, like, change, because to me, like, from a business perspective, I'm looking at this as kind of like, oh, especially when it comes to remote work and all of that, you can't necessarily have a lot of the the interactions, right, that you have with folks, and you can kind of have generative AI kind of, like, being there to help you almost, like, on your first day, let's say, for the first 180 days of you being at work, that you have this onboarding generative AI that kind of like helps you cope with being new to the organization, but also teaches you how to do your job, you know, and so that's again, amazing. Like that me, would be perfect. Yes. Yeah. And to me, I'm kind of like thinking in my head, just it's almost like, you know, because we were talking about the whole death thing and coping, you know, there has to be a, a emotional level in a, you know, I think intellectual level, so many different ranges that we can like tap into like generative AI, because even, um, yeah, being able to train someone to, let's say a lawyer, right. And you're going in our, you know, yeah, let's say a lawyer, or even just in high school in debate class, imagine now you can debate against AI and have it hammer through your points. And now, and this is the thing that I keep telling people, it's like the <laughs> technology as a catalyst, right? Like imagine how great like our high school debate club will be if they were trained by generative AI. And then how the world will change because we have such great debaters. The you know, bar one... is raised exactly. up and up and up. It's, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. Like the future is very, very scary. And like, you know, can we keep up? Should I just give up now? I want to just stick <laughs> my head in the sand because it's going to be too much. You know, I, I don't know. So it's, it can be overwhelming and it can be super exciting. And the use cases that are coming out, like just even over a big, glass of wine i forget it it would it would pour out all of the oh, things it. that you can do with with this type of technology and and i'm not sure how fast we're putting the brakes on it but i don't yeah. i don't know if it would ever become autonomous i can't say for sure that it won't but i don't know well, can I mean, you yeah and, and that's, <laughs> how that's are we what gonna i mean stop just like it? Yeah, like we we don't necessarily know where this is going to lead, right? And that's kind of like the thing that I tell people. It's just like at this point, you know, um, a lot of people believe oh, like we're going to have like a lot of control. I think the day, the fact in life is we don't necessarily have control. Time will continue moving like with, with or without us. You know, and I would say the same goes with uh, technology. There are only really like a handful of people that control the evolution of this technology. But then again... As consumers, we also have control, right? So if we demand for responsible use, right, for like every single company to do responsible use, that's what happened, right? Like with um, CPRA, right? Like, I mean, people were tired that, you know, their data is like not necessarily being used or they have power to be able to delete or correct their data. So. Right. Those are, again, those are kind of regulatory functions, right, that happen uh, within the world because people ask for it. And I think it will happen with AI, right, like with um, everything else. Yeah, sure, like we're building all of that. But at some point, there's got to be like people that, you know, play the tug of war in the real world and outside organizations, but really in the real world to actually institute responsible use, you know, and it still having the essence of a little bit of humanization like in technology because if there's none of that you know then when you know our ai overlords take over you know they're not going to have a human side to them so that's the reason why it's mm. very important to influence right at this stage make sure that our ai overlords like care bears and they learn from like the lessons of our <laughs> fables <laughs> so then they know like oh my god it turns out to be like this very very nice positive reinforcing oh boss right like think about like the uh think about like the best boss you've ever had and imagine that's your boss like because the ai is just like so oh my god i know everything there is to know like around the world and i know how to run the world and i'm gonna make sure that you know oh like i you know correct everything instead of uh destroy and then you know like 
yeah. Skynet and Terminator and time travel. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I, it's, it is crazy to think, and you want to train it on the best of the best, but it's so subjective, you know, the best, who's best, my best, your best, you know, like someone I, may have I'm, hated that boss because that boss kicks puppies on his way to his car. But, you know, so <laughs> it's, it's definitely interesting, but, you know, hopefully these things won't become sentient and, uh, we'll have time to know how to pull the plug if necessary. I mean, now I'm just thinking doom and gloom, but in the meantime, um, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, it's a, to, to me, it's like really funny how, you know, again, we can focus on like the bad things in life or, you know, you can just kind of look at the positive. I'm not saying ignore, right? Like we were just talking about, oh, make sure you're aware, et cetera. And I think that's what it is. You know, we, uh, it starts at the smallest step. You know, like if we ourselves are aware of exactly what it is that we're doing, the causality of things, you know, then, you know, there is a chance for us to be able to actually create something useful, helpful, et cetera. You know, yes, there will be some humans trying to abuse it. There will be some folks like misusing it, et cetera. And that is part of the equation, right? But at the end of the day, the same thing with the balance, you know, the balance scale. We just have to make sure that the good always outweigh the bad, yeah. you know. And I think, you know, it's, you know, and it's having that conversation, just like what you said, kind of like you know, going full circle, right? Mm -hmm. Is continue having the conversation, continue having, you know, those like moments and having that exchange or being able to influence without authority. Not just to like the human aspect of it, but also how we build AI, you know, and how we build that all together and, you know, how that will affect other technologies. Because, yeah, like I do believe, you know, that, you know, this, you know, generative AI uh, obviously boosted the popularity of AI general as a practice, you know, but I also think that it's going to boost, you know, a whole bunch of different technologies like the metaverse. Imagine having, actually having conversation in the metaverse so immersed into it you know and having a conversation with someone who's not even like a human who's helping you buy a checking account and also at the same time helping you get a mortgage and using all the available yeah. data points right to be able to do that I, again yeah. i'm sure there are a whole bunch of people that believe oh the metaverse is a joke and i would never interact with the metaverse mostly quote unquote seasoned people but the idea right is that we don't know because we don't control the interaction levels that our kids and our kids kids would be really into and be doing mm -hmm. you know and there's so many changes that's going to happen in the world and it's just good to be part of that change versus trying to stop the change that will yeah. inevitable inevitably, yeah. inevitably change again right at the end of the day just tell people listen get in the pool right get like just pool. get in the pool exactly. Yeah, and I really think because you know you who's going to be in there if we don't get in there, like all the regular people, the same people that started making all of the money when the internet became popular. That's right. Porn, porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and that's you don't that's want really that. Like, you you want yeah, to be in there, you know, doing yeah. yeah you don't want Absolutely. garbage. You want you want like good stuff coming out of it, and the uses are just you know. Even in the metaverse, I remember, and there's a whole different set of etiquettes and rules that you have to, you know, put upon right. yourself in, in the metaverse, like into central land, when you're standing there, or when you're walking up to someone else, there's a personal space in the metaverse to be considered. Absolutely. There's, there's so many industries that this actually opens up. You know how many people wrote netiquette books um, for the metaverse, you know, like don't stand too close to someone and, yeah. you know, do this and do that all of this, you know, we think jobs are going to go away, but jobs are going to be arise like left and right, you know, prompting courses and, and, um, so many, so many different things, so many different, uh, roles can be born out of embracing innovation and technology. Yep. No, that's right. And again, a lot of things just being transformed, you know, all the numbers are still going to be there. It's just going to be transformed into something else. And again, if you're not aware into what it is transforming into, then yes, mm -hmm. it will feel like you lost your job, you know, but if you're aware into what it's transforming to, you can be transforming with and then become what it is transforming into, you know, the same thing is like, you know, I don't know, like finance people who believe that, you know, Microsoft Excel, you know, doesn't work for them. They didn't get hired, right? Like it's just, 
there's this person like still licking their fingers and going through like papers and like writing out like you know the debits and credits like in like a cell in like um, a piece of paper and telling you oh I'm gonna ship your records and it'll take seven days to get to you or and you have an accountant that you know has everything you know in Excel and just like kind of sends it to you via email you know and there's a point in time and I don't right. know if you saw that segment too like at the Today Show and they were like kind of like figuring out what the at symbol is. And they're like, you know, they're like uh, calling it a round. Like, it's just like, they were calling it so many different <laughs> names. But that's what I mean. It's just like a generative AI. We don't know what it is. And it's uh, going to become as mundane as email. And, you know, eventually it'll be technology that we're going to be saying, oh, no one's using it. Same thing as marketing right now. How many people even really utilize email, right? So it's almost like, again, like when you're communicating and you're sending it through a channel that no one's, you know, really using, you're thinking, oh my God, our marketing campaign isn't working. Like the marketing campaign might work if you gave it a chance in a channel that's actually being used. Right. Right. If you sent so it through that's... Snapchat or if you changed it up and exactly. did something different or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, you know, and the bus... that's what awareness. Yeah. You don't want to miss the bus. It's, it's down the line. Right. It's not coming back. But... That's right. Oh, good. And if we're too old and we can't get with the program, then just become a consultant, change your tune, think about your retirement account, That's and, right. you know, just talk to pe old people about old ways. That's and right. Those who can't do everyone. teach. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Those, yeah, those who can't do teach. So consult. Exactly. But we do, we do need to remember the ways that things used to be done. You see those videos with kids that are confronted with a rotary phone, like a landline, and they have no idea what to do with it. They don't, Absolutely. they don't know how to dial a number. They don't know what it's used for. They don't know why it's plugged in. So, yeah. you know, I mean, if the grid ever goes down, all of these things that you and I just talked about are wiped away. We have to remember debits and credits, you know, like how to do the ledger, yeah. um, LIFO, FIFO, like you need to remember these tips <laughs> and, and tools in case you ever do have to go back to the paper and pencil way of doing things. That's so I think right. Probably my generation, maybe your generation. You sound like you're younger than I am. Um, but you know, we had the I had the best of both worlds because I may know how to function if the grid goes down. <laughs> Whereas mm -hmm. some of these younger kids are just gonna stand where they are and not move. I don't know where to go. I don't know <laughs> what to do. I don't have my phone app, so I don't even can't map it. I don't know how to get there. No, but that, but that's that's kind of like the wonder of it, right? It's um you know so back in the day when I used to use the rotary phone because we're both seasoned, um you know when I used to use the rotary phone, I remembered all. I'm not saying some. I'm saying all of my friends', friends phone, phone numbers. numbers. And, yep. Oh yeah, you remembered everyone's phone numbers. Now I remember my phone number on a good day, right? Like and. That's what I mean. It's like, oh, but, you know, so I can't remember my phone number, um, but then, you know, I can build mobile apps. So it's almost like if you kind of look at the scale of things, it's weird. But if you're an organization that's like, oh, your KPIs, you need to remember the phone number, you know, then of course you're going to be forced to, okay, I need to remember the phone number, et cetera, when the entire world has been building mobile apps. And that's how organizations die, right? It's because you set the wrong KPIs, set the wrong OKRs. And that's, yeah, definitely like a piece where, you know, I, even for myself as a, you know, person, when I set my KPIs and OKRs, I really do think about really what truly is the value of that today. Is this something that I'm calling out because, oh, it's something that I used to do, oh, but I've been doing it for 15 years. If that's the reason why I'm doing something, right. then I definitely just need to move on. If I can't think of a better reason, right, to do it other than the excuse of, oh, but I've been doing this for so long, it's just, that's that's not good, you know? And yeah, we just need to like move on. I agree. That's a great note to leave off on because I've taken too much of your afternoon. Now we, we started with like 10 minutes, 15 minutes of tech issues. And then now we're, we talked all about the future and then now I'll let you get back to real life. Time to put your feet <laughs> back on the ground and go do something that's productive or unproductive. Go watch Netflix. Uh, exactly. Like, it's all again, again, just like what I said, no other place I'd spend my afternoon. in. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I do appreciate the time. I will, I will let you go. I will see you back on LinkedIn and wherever else we coexist. And it's a great, it's a great That's thing. Right. Like I, you and I would have never crossed paths if, if I hadn't like 
hopped in there to strangers and been like, I love what you're doing or, you know, Hey, can we chat? So I I'm just that type of person to reach out, but I wish yeah. more people would do that to just engage in conversations. Cause I feel like I'm smarter for having known you already. The, the ditto. And that's kind of like the thing I uh, tell folks, right? It's just, you know, there's so much opportunity in front of us, you know, it's just sometimes we choose not to take them, you know, and, yeah, the one thing I tell folks is like, you know, typically the hardest thing to do in life is the right thing to do. And it was definitely harder, right, to reach out to people. I, I do the same thing. I reach out to like strangers, to people and all of that and yearning for more knowledge and more more like building that network with people. Because I know that, you know, one person's knowledge is finite when, you know, if we as a network, as a village, as a community kind of like contribute on each other, like then it'll be infinite because I may not know like, you know, certain things that you know, but I know, you know. So then when someone asks me the question, I can be like, well, let me tap on my network. Let me call Jessica and all of that. But it wouldn't have happened if, again, if we haven't interacted, right? Like, so right. no, it's really neat that, you know, we've done this and yeah, again, like, thanks so much for having me here because this has been amazing. Likewise, likewise. Okay. I will let you go. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Oh, you're welcome. You too.